hello, this is Lady Tahila from the Covenant of the Open Mind, Elder of the Open Minded Path, and you're watching Metaphysics 101. Hail and welcome. topic this time is still quantum physics. This is the second lecture on quantum mechanics. Uh, the first one we focused more on talking about quantum weirdness and what makes particles different from macroscopic objects, what allows them to experience different physics. And this time we're going to be talking about randomness. So Einstein once said that God does not play dice with the universe. I'm sure you've all heard that quote before. And he said it as a way of suggesting that there must be some kind of hidden variable, something to explain why a particle might pick one state or another that's not just random. Uh, he did not believe that there could be that degree of randomness. He believed that anything could be understood and predicted if we just understood it well enough. Well, many years have passed, and it turns out on that particular front that Einstein was wrong. We actually uh, do understand the science well enough now, and we have the experiments that can prove it really is random. A particle really is in two states at once. It's not that it's in one state or the other, and we just don't know which it is. It really is both states at once. It goes through both slits, interferes with itself, right? All of that crazy stuff we spoke about in the last video. So if you haven't checked out the previous video, please uh, check out the link in the description and go watch that before this one. So what does it mean that God plays dice with the universe? Well, what it really means is that there are some events that are pseudo-random and there are some events that are truly random. So an example of a pseudo-random event, something that seems random but kind of isn't, would be like choosing numbers out of a hat, like sheets of little pieces of paper that you fold up and put inside a hat and you pick out a number and see what it says. And it might appear like that is random, but in reality, if you knew the location of all the particles that made up all those papers, you could predict what papers are about to get pulled out of the hat, okay, leaving the randomness of the conscious decision of which paper to pull aside, because we're going to come back to that in a moment. A truly random event would be, for example, the decay of an atom or a particle, which is governed by what's called the weak nuclear force. The weak nuclear force is what determines when uh, an atom or a particle will decay and the nature of that decay, what particles it turns into and uh, what trajectory those particles will take after the particle, uh, the larger particle decays. That is a truly random process. You know, you can never predict exactly when a particle will decay or when an atom will decay. Truly random. But you can predict when a certain number of particles will have decayed. Okay, so this is where you've heard of the phrase half-life. You know, if you have like a neutron sitting on its own, uh, a neutron is eventually, after a certain amount of time, it's going to just pff, decay after maybe like 10 minutes, gone. Okay, and you can't predict it exactly, but if you have a certain number of particles and you know how many you have, then you can predict when half of those particles will have decayed pretty much with certainty. And this is because of the nature of statistics, of statistical mechanics. Okay, the mechanics of systems that are based on chaos or randomness. So this principle is actually one that most of you probably do intuitively understand. You probably already have a conceptual understanding of statistics because you do experience statistics in your daily life. You don't have to take for granted that there's going to be air in the room where you are sitting. Mathematically, it's possible for all of the air in the room that you're in right now to just move to a different space. It could do that, okay? But it won't because the chances of all of the particles moving into another space is not high. You know, if you have a room with a lot of heat or a pressure, uh, a smaller space, and then you have a bigger space. So say you open the window. My window is open right now. Okay, so the air is going to flow from the warmer space to the cooler space because in the cooler space, there's more room. At the, at the barrier, the particles will slowly exchange some amount of heat uh, so that they can reach an equilibrium, right? Everything is constantly trying to reach this base state where it's actually in the most chaotic state possible. If you have a hot 
water faucet and a cold water faucet and you turn them both on you have hot water coming in you have cold water coming in they're going to flow in a particular direction based off of the heat of the water if you turn the faucets off is the hot water going to stay on one side of the tub and the cold water going to stay on another no right you intuitively know that in time the the tub is going to become one temperature Okay, the hot water and cold water mix, and the hot water cools the cold water down, and the tub becomes a warm temperature, something in between hot and cold. And if you leave the tub sitting there for long enough, the heat will eventually come out of the water and into the air, right? And then the water will be the same temperature as the air eventually, right? They'll exchange energy and try to reach an equilibrium. What does that equilibrium look like? Well, all the particles in that equilibrium state are not moving in an ordered way. Each individual particle can move whatever way it wants. There's no physics telling it you have to move this way, you have to move that way. Nothing is telling it what to do. So it just does whatever it wants. It's a maximum chaotic state. And that concept in physics, the concept of chaos in physics, is called entropy. Chaos, randomness, uh, it essentially describes uh, a state where the movements of the particles that make up whatever the system is, uh, those movements are less predictable, okay? When they are completely unpredictable, uh, then you have maximum entropy, okay? And that, and that is the universe is constantly moving to a place of, of, of more chaos, uh, and, and you have to put energy into a system if you want it to become ordered. So, so that's chaos. Okay, that's entropy. That's how chaos is looked at in physics. That's, how, that's the function it plays. Okay, this is like statistical mechanics, thermodynamics. Now, the next thing we're going to talk about is entangled particles. That means that those particles are in a system where if one of them has a change, then the other one is going to experience a change as well. And you can cause particles to become entangled very easily because if you remember back to the previous lecture we talked a little bit about how particles experience time differently than we do particles can remember things in the present and in doing so change what happened in the past and it's not like they go back in time change something and then move forward in time if that's what they were doing we would be able to tell that with the experiments that we've done to prove that particles are in a superposition of states. And what we have found instead is that they can kind of just fold through time using the higher dimensions that we don't see, and we'll talk about this in a later lecture, this is coming, this is string theory, and they can use aspects of physics, they can use things that macroscopic objects are not able to physically make use of. Take a pion, Pion is a spin zero particle, which means that it does not interact with magnetic fields, and it decays into two electrons. And those two electrons are spin one half particles, and so they have to add up to spin zero. So one will be plus a half, and one will be minus a half. Okay, and those, and that just determines which direction they go, basically, if you put them inside of a magnetic field. It doesn't have anything to do with actual spinning. Spin just refers to the way that a particle will interact with a magnetic field. Okay, the Earth has a magnetic field. Um, you know, any, any kind of magnet is producing a field. That's what creates the force that allows magnets to be attracted to each other. So um, particles uh, interact with magnetic fields in different ways based on their spin. Okay, so a pion decays into two electrons, and those electrons have to have one plus a half, one minus a half. Uh, you shoot those electrons away from each other in opposite directions. That's what happens when the pion decays. Okay, they shoot away, and you measure one of them over here. You measure one, and you say, are you a plus one half or are you a minus a half? You put it through a magnetic field, and you see what it does. Whatever that particle chooses to do in that moment, the other particle will do the opposite. And these particles will know what to do faster than you could possibly send a message. And so that's where the idea that particles can choose different memories comes from. If there's two timelines, and this is, okay, the first particle is spin up, the second particle is spin down. And this timeline is, okay, the first particle is spin down, and the second particle is spin up. Okay, two timelines. 
Here's the present moment when you say, what spin are you, first particle? The particles will just choose one of these timelines. They'll just pick one. And it's completely random which one they're going to select. There's no way to predict which of those two options they're going to take. It's 50%, 50%. Flipping a coin is more predictable <laughs> than which state these electrons are going to choose to collapse into when you measure them. And if that, if that statement doesn't make sense to you, go back to the previous video. <laughs> this results in particles modifying their properties in ways which violate the rules of the physical realm. Okay, so a, a human can't just choose a different timeline. If you wake up tomorrow and you have all of the knowledge of a person who went to school for physics, okay? You got a degree in physics, and you got a job after college, and then you got a doctorate, and you've been working in the field for 15 years, and you invented this really cool thing, and you are a famous inventor, and you wake up, and those are all of your memories. And you, you really do remember it. You remember being in the classes. You remember uh, doing all the math, and all of the knowledge, even, of that math is in your mind somehow, magically. You wake up and you have a different past in your mind. We don't remember that. So you're going to have to prove to us that that's really the truth by now inventing something and, and making a name for yourself. You're going to, it's going to be different. You can't just, you can't just choose a different timeline where in the present, in the present moment, you're in a different place in space time. Okay. You can't do this. If this is where you are in space time in the present moment, all you can do is become aware of the alternate timeline that you could have experienced. And you can experience it in your mind as if it really happened. And if you can't tell the difference between what really happened, then we would just call you delusional. We'd say, well, you're not a famous inventor, so you are misremembering the past. And that's because, going back to what we said at the beginning, when you have an individual person, they can have uncertainty in how they view the past. They can experience memories and false memories in a unique way. And in fact, everyone does. But when you have many people, when you have many people remembering the past, that uncertainty goes away. And you start to have a picture of objective reality. But as the people who witnessed these events die, and all you have are written testimonies of the events, or oral testimonies, like my grandmother told me, then the uncertainty starts to come back. So the farther back in time an event occurred, the more uncertainty surrounds that event, and the more likely uh, a large number of people can misremember the past in a way that changes the past. You know what I'm saying? It, it doesn't change the past in the sense that there is a thing that objectively happened, uh, but it doesn't matter anymore what objectively happened because all that matters is how is, how is it influencing the present? Where does the past go? It goes to memory. And, and memory is all that we have of it. So if the way we remember it changes, then the past literally changes. If everyone remembers the past happening differently, but there's physical evidence that demonstrates how the past happened, then the past can't be changed because we have evidence that supports the objective nature of the past. So for instance, evolution happened. It's not just a theory. It's not how scientific theories work. Evolution happened. It did. Okay, uh, there were animals before us on this earth that are not the same as us, that have evolved to where we are today. Now, if you want to argue, and this is where we branch into the metaphysics, if you want to argue that the past came into existence how it is, so it seems like the universe has existed for 14 billion years, but it hasn't. It just, it came into existence a certain number of years ago, say 6,000. Okay, that's what a lot of Jewish people believe. And it was created with a past that makes it look older. Okay, well, that's functionally the same. Okay, that's functionally the same as the universe being created 14 billion years ago and experiencing 14 billion years. What you can't say is that those fossils aren't real and that they don't indicate something that is really old. 
Okay, but you could say, well, this is so old that the chances of it physically happening this way, now it's uncertain. And you wind up in this weird place and you go down this like crazy loophole where you're like, nothing is real and nothing is certain. <laughs> it's like insane. So that's only possible. The only reason why those two theories can coexist is because there's nobody alive today who lived that long. So we don't really know if the past happened or if we just think it did. All we know is that there's physical evidence of a past. And so it doesn't really matter if that physical evidence was created because we were meant to believe the past exists. It doesn't matter. Functionally, the effect on the present is the same. So you can choose what you want to believe, and as long as you acknowledge the facts, it doesn't matter. It doesn't change the present at all. Macroscopic objects, uh, trees, plants, houses, they can't just remember different timelines. Uh, you're not going to just, you know, walk into a house one day and it looks some way, and then you go leave, and then you come back and the house looks different. It's not going to happen. Maybe it'll be because of your own mind, because you are misremembering the layout of the house, but you're so convinced that you're remembering the right layout of the house. Now let's talk about this phenomenon. So this is randomness as it influences people. What quantum physics tells us is that chaos and randomness truly exist, but only on the most subtle levels. Okay, the only truly random events in the universe are like the decay of a particle, the decay of an atom. Truly random. Everything else, if you knew the location of all the particles and everything, you could predict what's going to happen. But there is a part of the human body, the nervous system, that is electrical, that is susceptible to minute changes in energy. And so the smallest chaos on the smallest level of existence can influence everything in the universe, it's something called chaos theory. The randomness that exists on the smallest level uh, creates little perturbations in the energy field that is everything, that is existence itself, the energy field that is in all of the particles that make up the air in the room, that is in all of the particles that make up the walls of the room. It's in all of the particles that make up your body, energy. And that energy can have small perturbations based on random events, okay, the decay of particles. And the particles decay largely in the upper atmosphere, but, you know, particles are always decaying all around you, decay. Uh, you know, people are always scared of, like, radioactivity, but there's probably, like, a good amount of radioactivity in the room that you're in right now. Okay, it's not enough to like hurt you. <laughs> That's why it's silly for people to be scared of like nuclear power just because it's radioactive. It's like, well, bananas are radioactive. I did a lab in college where I literally just like broke a banana peel down <laughs> over time and let it decay and measured how radioactive it was. It was measurably radioactive. Okay, so, you know, radioactivity is everywhere. And what it, what it essentially is, is it's just the energy from the decay of certain types of particles. And particles always decay from uh, larger atomic numbers, so higher mass to lower mass. Fission, okay, the breaking of two particles, which is what you use for nuclear power. You break two particles apart into subsequent particles, and, and the lower mass particles usually don't have the exact same mass as the higher mass particle, and that difference in energy is what gives you energy. And it's a very, very small difference in energy, but because you have so many particles decaying, that turns into a lot of energy, which is why nuclear energy is one of the least harmful to the environment because the amount of waste you produce based on the amount of energy you attain from the process is fantastic. Um, and then you have like the sun, okay, you have a very massive object and actually the gravity of that object keeps the particles from escaping and so does the tidal forces that are produced uh, from the fusion, it's like an engine that's sustained by a force that's pushing out and gravity pulling in. And that's why when a really massive sun collapses, when the engine runs out of fuel, supernova, right? Because gravity causes all the particles to slam into each other and that produces a ton of energy and throws the particles out into space. Um, but as long as the engine has fuel, as long as it has lower mass particles that it can shove together and turn into higher mass particles, uh, then it's capable of producing energy that uh, pushes outward and stops the gravity from pulling inward. A star is really just a balance of forces in and out. 
And because you're fusing two lower mass particles into a larger particle, and the difference in mass between the two lower ones and the higher one, again, there's a slight difference in mass. And that difference in energy is, is the energy the sun emits, which we receive on Earth as ultraviolet light. Now, it also produces energy, it produces uh, light particles, basically, that have a lot of energy in a bunch of different wavelengths, and most of the particles that are too high energy uh, get displaced by the electromagnetic field that surrounds the Earth. The Earth's core is a big metal ball, and it spins really fast, and that produces an electromagnetic field um, that causes the light, which is basically just electromagnetic radiation, to be displaced around the planet and 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 that's called the solar winds and because the magnetic field lines of earth run like this that's why the north and south pole you see the aurora borealis aurora borealis is the electromagnetic discharge that gets diverted from our field um, but is carried along our field lines down close to the earth close enough where you can see it so anyway uh Lots of high energy particles, lots of massive particles uh, get created when they smash into each other in the upper atmosphere. Those particles decay. That decay is random. That influences the way that all of the energy on the Earth moves on a massive scale, which can influence all of us on a very subtle scale. This is the metaphysics part of this because, you know, there's no way for us to measure the tiny perturbations in energy right now. We don't have the science. Literally, we don't have the capability of measuring it, maybe one day. But uh, the idea is that we could, in the part of us that is just electrical, the nervous system, uh, that might be capable of picking up on these tiny perturbations. And this is what causes people to uh, choose truly random things. Um, so if someone does something out of the blue that doesn't make sense, they suddenly just are like, I have to do this thing. It very well could just be their way of reacting to whatever slight randomness is in the universe. Uh, how we relate to order and randomness uh, and the forces that make up the foundation of the universe, how we relate to those things influences how we go about deriving meaning from what is essentially a purposeless existence. Ultimately, you know, every cause does lead to an effect. So you could say everything happens for a reason, and you just don't know what the reason is yet. And that's factual. You could also say that everything is just random and there's no way to predict all of the specific things that are going to happen in a person's life. And that's also accurate because there is a degree of randomness that will influence a lot of people. Now, the more solidly you believe in order, the more solidly you believe that everything happens for a reason, the less chaotic you're going to act because you are trying to embody order. And so even if you feel those chaotic urges, you'll be more inclined to ignore them. A person who is embracing chaos, who is inviting chaos into their life um, by just doing random things at times, or who doesn't really care, who doesn't think that there is a higher order, who doesn't really relate to order that way, uh, that person is likely to have a more chaotic lifestyle. Um, and chaos can bring good and bad things. What you put out into the universe is what you get back. So oftentimes, People who respond negatively towards chaos tend to have a more negative view on existence. They have less fun. They have a less pleasant time because every time something random happens, uh, they're like, oh, great, now it's this, now it's that, you know. Um, and so you can really choose what kind of person you want to be. And just because you embrace chaos doesn't mean you're going to be that kind of person that has a negative time in life. It's just like playing the stock market. The stock market is a random system, and what we value from one day to the next is completely different because there's so many people, again, just like how when you have a lot of particles, suddenly things become predictable. Well, if you know the way that, you know, if you can predict the trends because you have a good understanding of human psychology and you're paying attention to what's going on in the world, then yeah, maybe you're going to be better at playing the stock market than somebody who like has no idea what's going on in the world, right? Because in mass, you can start to predict trends of how things are going to go. 
but it's never certain. No macroscopic system is truly random, not in the same way that particles experience true randomness. But because particles exist true randomness, and because we're all an interconnected thing, therefore we do experience true randomness in, in ways that make it harder to predict the system than some people would like. But when you play the stock market, you can be one of several different kinds of people. You can play a certain, you know, you can put your money on a certain type of account that you know is going to do well and it's going to go up over time. Or you can uh, put your money into more risky accounts and it's more volatile and maybe you'll lose a lot of money every so often, but every so often you'll gain a lot of money, right? And so, um, you know, people have different strategies based on how attached they are to their money. <laughs> so if you don't want to lose any money at all, you're going to play the safe route. So those are the people who are going to um, want to stick with a deity-based religion. You're going to want to stick with something that brings order into your life and you're going to want to emulate order because then you can count on having positive things from one day to the next. And maybe you don't have any like really crazy good things happen out of the blue. Okay, maybe every day you have slightly predictable things and you're working up towards something. Um, but you know that you're not really going to have any random really bad things happen either. A person who is more inclined to take risks and, and just like is more comfortable with uh, stress and chaos going on in their lives, then that person would be more inclined to work with chaos, would be work, inclined to work with um, either chaos deities or demons. And that person is going to allow this chaotic stuff to happen and act randomly when they feel the urge to act randomly and not try to embody order. And as a result of that, uh, they will find that they have a lot of really great and a lot of really bad things happening in their life and they have to learn how to handle the bad things with grace and that will cause you know the bad things to be not as bad and the good things to be really good right so that person is um, you know and it depends on the person some people choose to take that chaotic path and wind up losing big time some people go crazy <laughs> some people literally lose their minds working with chaos it is dangerous and any and, and in the end you can get to the same place whether you choose to work with order or chaos either path can help give a person meaning can help give a person a purpose for their life can make them feel good about what is essentially purposeless the things that happen to you that seem like coincidence that cause you to derive some meaning from them that change the course of your life were not random okay they were not because physical existence is pseudo random but your reaction to them was susceptible to randomness and that's why you have the power to generate purpose and non-animated things don't. And so that is uh, our conclusion of quantum physics and our discussion of randomness. If you have any questions, please drop a comment on this video or shoot us an email at covenantoftheopenmind at gmail.com. And I'd be happy to address your questions from everyone here at the Covenant of the Open Mind. Blessed be.